Hello, I'm Professor Ian Hickey, the Co-Director of Health and Policy at the Brain and Mind Centre of the University of Sydney. It's my great pleasure to participate in this meeting organised by Michael Krauss and colleagues and really focus on how we might improve health outcomes for young people, particularly in the areas of substance misuse and mental health. I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm sitting at the moment, which are the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, one of the important of our First Nations here in Australia. I'm just going to proceed to share my screen with you. So now I'm assuming at this point that you can see my title slide here about improving mental health and substance misuse outcomes in young people and talk about the Australian experience, largely pre, but also now influenced by COVID, and particularly the roles of new technologies and models of care. Obviously, we live in very challenging times. And really the challenge for all of us is how could we have lifted our game pre-COVID? And now with the COVID era that we live in, how are we going to lift our game to improve outcomes across the board in my own areas of work, particularly in young people? Important to say some of the technology that I'll talk about is something in which I am part of a company. There's a spin-off between the University of Sydney and PricewaterhouseCooper, which conducts independent trials uh, of the particular types of technologies I'll talk about. I'm also a member of the World Economic Forum, Global Futures Councils on Digital Mental Health. Some of the additional data provided here is by the Matilda Centre at the University of Sydney, directed by Professor Marie Thiessen, and with data from her colleague Tim Slade and some of the work of Francis K. Lamkin. I have been a National Mental Health Commissioner in Australia previously. Important to say about Australia, we talk about ourselves a lot overseas, but when we look internally, we have good policies, we have quite an active community discussion, we have a great deal of political engagement. When it comes to actually delivering services effectively on the ground, we're not gold medal winners. Most places in the world aren't. We all have a long way to go. So while awareness has gone up, particularly here in Australia, actually deliver better services for mental health in particular, and I must say specifically in the areas of substance misuse and for younger people, we have a good deal more to be done. Comparable with Canada, we're a middle ranking country with regards to suicide rates in general and for many other mental health outcomes. And quite like Canada in terms of the nature of what we say is a universal health system, we're challenged by the subpopulations that exist, particularly those affecting our indigenous populations and particularly the quality of health care to our rural and regional centres. We largely operate in a very similar way to Canada with a system that talks about universality, puts a lot of emphasis on primary care and good quality emergency care, but has never, in my view, really shifted towards being responsive of the many individuals who actually present these problems. And probably most importantly, with systems based on family practice and emergency medicine, never really shifted to those who don't fit easily into those systems, particularly young people, and particularly those with substance misuse and mental health problems. So what we've seen in Australia throughout the period immediately pre-COVID and over the last five to 10 years is generally an increase suicide rates, not going down, despite the amount of effort and national attention that it's received. And in fact, in terms of years of potential life lost, data just from the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, just before Christmas indicated the extent to which years of productive life lost due to intentional self-harm, suicide and related accident injury far exceed other causes, ischemic heart disease, cancer, etc. I think we need to continue to emphasise in our political, our professional and our personal lives the true costs of failing to deal with the impacts of mental health and related substance misuse. And of course, this plays out differentially by age and has its greatest impacts on younger people. Also in our particular areas, we look at its impacts on First Nations peoples and other disadvantaged populations. If we specifically look at suicide rates in Australians in young people in those rates, 15 to 19, what you see in the last five years is a continuous trend upwards for both males and females. Also, to some degree, an earlier age of onset of suicidal behaviour. Importantly, in Australia, as in Canada, regionality really matters. And the kinds of the statistics I was associated with myself during the uh, period as being Australian, one of Australia's National Mental Health Commissioners, that issue of regionality, just how different things are between our major city centres, particularly in the southeast of Australia, and other areas of the rest of our population in terms of mental health outcomes, such as suicide, deaths by overdose, and other related factors, is very significant. 
So at times it becomes not that sensical to talk about national outcomes as distinct from regional outcomes. A very large focus of the models of care that I'm tied up with at the moment and health system development has to do with making sure that care is high quality, accessible, personalised, close to where you live and is accessible and affordable, not just on a national average, but for many of the populations who are most disadvantaged. Of course, the issue around psychological distress in young people is something we see across all of our countries and data from North America over the last 10 years has clearly indicated the extent to which increased rates of psychological distress, particularly depression in high school students has been on the increase in the United States. And we see exactly the same thing in Australia with regards to rates of high psychological distress over that period. The proportion of young people with high rates of psychological distress has significantly improved. Uh, it has significantly got larger, meaning, of course, the mental health of younger people is worse over that 10 year period. Of course, a great deal of debate as to the why. And that, I think, is a complex sociological argument. Simple explanations in terms of technology or other social factors don't give a simple explanation. It's complex. I think the challenge is, though, what are we to do in relation to those particular problems in terms of psychological distress and suicide rates? Interestingly, one of the factors that has tended to improve in Australia over that period and has been the subject of a great deal of public attention is actually alcohol use and alcohol misuse and the early ages of initiation of alcohol use. So while psychological stress has got worse and you might expect that substance misuse would get worse in association with that, we've actually tended to see for our favourite substance in Australia, alcohol, declining rates of alcohol use at early ages during that period. Now, that's not to say that alcohol doesn't remain extremely problematic in Australia. It does, and rates of risky drinking in young people remain significantly high, with up to 15% of 18 to 24-year-olds reporting frequent periods of having more than 11 drinks. Of course, the issue around all adolescent disorders is the onset in the adolescent period of all of the disorders of which we're interested in, and the sequences of the extent to which mental health problems may precede substance use, the extent to which substance use disorders, depending on age of exposure and types of exposure, may precede the onset of mental health problems. One of the big realities we have to come to terms with is it is no good to wait until people are in their 20s or 30s or 40s and then start to talk about interventions that might assist those who are already in significant trouble. The preventative issues, which may be relevant to childhood and early adolescence, need to be tied to the effective delivery of services early in the course of illness in the adolescent periods, at the times of exposure or at times of high risk. When you look at the disability and costs, it still remains the case that in terms of years of life lives with disability, that 60% of disability costs, not being a school and education is due to alcohol and substance misuse in the critical 15 to 34 year age group. One of the issues that does count in Australia, and we continuously have discussion with politicians and others, is the financial cost of not acting in this area. We continue to pay not only the social and the human cost, but the financial cost. So in a lot of our work, while there's an emphasis on ageing, and certainly in the COVID period, the issues around ageing and the difficulties for healthcare, we must continue to emphasise the relevance of child and youth initiatives in this area if we are to make real progress. Now, real progress depends on preventative measures, public health measures, but also service systems. And the reality is that we have never had service systems that actually connect with young people. And the repeated surveys that we've had in Australia over the last 20 years show continuously the extent to which we do not connect with young people, so aged 16 to 24, males or females, and particularly don't connect with those with comorbid substance abuse or with substance abuse as their primary problem. If you look globally at mental health and substance misuse services, one of the issues has been just increasing access. But I think one of the lessons that we've learned in Australia, very importantly, over a long period, is that access alone does not fix the problem. And I must say now, in the uh, digital mental health and digital era of healthcare, just access to more digital products doesn't necessarily deliver better care either. So I think one of the really challenging issues for us, as, as digital health potentially increases access further than property-based and location-based services. We've got to also be attending to, are they quality services? Do they actually deliver the outcomes of interest? 
to young people, to families themselves, as well to the wider community. We've got to get away from simple step care notions where people fail first and only when they are very unwell and actually very difficult to treat due to long-standing difficulties and comorbidity do we step in. We've got to look at actually whatever stage of illness you're at that we step in early to provide the appropriate care. So right care first time is our current motto for young people with mental health and substance abuse problems. We could be more focused on people, more focused on not whether they meet the diagnostic criteria set, but actually making sure we're connecting early to prevent impairment and change the course of illness. So when we talk about early intervention goals, we also got to say there are a range of different goals. It isn't just an issue of mental health. It isn't just an issue of substance issues. It isn't just an issue of physical health. It isn't just an issue of financial outcomes. It's all of those things. They're all related. So that multi-dimensional framework needs to be key. And in a lot of our work, independent of what combination of problems that you have, mental health, substance abuse, social disadvantage, what is your economic education and social outcome? To what extent are we changing this outcomes of this critical period to give people improved life trajectories. As we do that, clearly we have to move away from treating the average to much more personalised care regimes. For us, that means a greater focus on actually trajectories and stages of illness, much greater personalisation rather than focus on diagnostic categories. Additionally, whatever we do can't only be done for a small number of people or a small number of wealthy people in our larger cities or a small number of people who understand how the system works. It's got to be evidence-based, it's got to be personalised, but it's got to occur at scale. So important developments for us here in Australia have been specific use services under the brand of Headspace, different to traditional family practice, but primary care based, as well as a range of new e-health developments. Not just taking existing services online with no real growth in capacity or no increase in quality. So there's a lot to be done if we're to see improved outcomes. For us, we try to place all of these within developmental perspectives. What are the childhood temperaments and phenotypes of interest? What are the adolescent onsets? What are the comorbidities with substance misuse and other problems as you move through the whole developmental phase? We've particularly pursued notions of clinical staging alongside that of traditional diagnoses and try to look very much at how the onset of particular different sets of symptoms and trajectories then are associated with the development of particularly factors like substance misuse, but also other neurocognitive and social impairments. What sorts of symptoms in what sorts of situations give rise to the syndromes, either comorbid syndromes or the first syndrome, whether the first syndrome is a classic mental health, anxiety, mood disorder syndrome, or the first syndrome is a substance misuse syndrome, and what happens from there. Basically, that earlier intervention focus to deal with a set of problems the person presents and actually take effective action early. So Headspace has been the uh, brand in Australia that's been particularly championed by my great friend and colleague, Pat McGorry, and others, originally director of myself of the Headspace uh, company, which has rolled these out in Australia, now uh, moving to hundreds of centres across the country as an entry point. It's an entry point. It isn't a complete service system. It's an entry point. And it's an entry point which largely picks up mental health on a place-based set of approaches. Really interesting, if you like, a late 20th century concept. In fact, the first centres came into being Australia in the 2000s, before, before we had the current digital mental health capacities that we now have. And we have been reading these clinics and my uh, partner in life and in much of my work with Scott has led our own particular colleagues. We've developed our own cohorts to follow these groups of young people. And we've recently published some material about those particular cohorts, looking at over 6,000 young people and I just point out that within a range of primary disorders and presenting syndromes, although these are set up as primary mental health type facilities, the proportion of people that have substance abuse as their primary disorder is quite small. Although about 10% certainly have a substance misuse syndrome comorbidly with other syndromes. Interestingly though, people with substance use related disorders don't actively use these even though they are primarily set up for young people and were intended to attract people with substance misuse. When you go to the degree of substance use in the actual syndromes we extend, then substance use is very common. Alcohol use, substance use occurring at least two thirds of the people that we are seeing 
as is the case in Australia, alcohol, cannabis, rates of alcohol and cannabis use being considerably higher in these populations than the general population, tobacco use being much higher. We now, of course, in Australia have uh, general daily smoking rates in single digits and certainly in young people, mostly in single digits, so to have a rate of tobacco use of 38% in these cohorts is very high. We also have quite high rates of stimulant use and other prescribed drug use in these areas. So substance misuse comorbidity is actually very common in these samples, but not often the reason that these people are actually seeking care. You'll note also the very high rates of deliberate self-harm and suicidal ideation in these cohorts. Although these are early intervention cohorts, they are kids with lots of trouble. What we have been proposing as a model of care is a multidimensional one, which says functional outcomes is what matters. Illness types and categories is just one set of issues that we are tracking over time. The other important ones really being related to self-harm, substance misuse and physical health comorbidities. And we are really interested in the patterns of interaction and the style of interventions that are delivered that may deliver more than one type of outcome. What are those relationships over time? What should be the focus? And how can services be coordinated to deliver the appropriate mix to achieve all of those outcomes? Many days I run into colleagues who say, too hard, can't do it. I only do diagnosis. I only treat substance abuse. I only do safety planning. I'm just here for the physical health bit because that's what I'm trained to do and that's what I do. The reality is we've got to work in a different way collectively and deal with the sets of problems that young people actually present us with. We've been following these young people over time and we know that they actually transition to major disorders at quite high rates and that those particular factors are predicted by their symptoms at these times and by earlier childhood factors, as well as other things like sleep, wake cycle, circadian disturbance. So a failure to intervene or even intervening lightly in these areas is associated with poorer outcomes. The outcomes, however, are kind of interesting in terms of the quite variable trajectories that young people are actually on, that some deteriorate early in the course of illness and actually need help immediately. A lot of others take quite a long time to improve if they're going to actually receive improvement and need more sustained services over times. And there are groups of people who we're currently dealing with, often with neurodevelopmental problems, with comorbidity, with related substance misuse, that we are currently not changing the trajectory or outcome. Much work to be under, done to understand which trajectories people are on and which combinations of interventions will be more likely to improve these functional outcomes. So we've been trying to take this type of work into new models of care, particularly right care first time. And we would add now right care first time where you live. We have a large project now supported by the BHP Foundation trying to take that to eight regional frameworks in Australia. New models of care, technology enabled, that promote better assessment, multidimensional assessment earlier on, but combine that with real time monitoring, technology enabled services, assessing multidimensional outcomes. I say to clinicians all the time, I don't really care why people get better. I care about the kids who do not get better or deteriorate and that we know that and that we change and track and try to improve outcomes on an individual basis and know that collectively. To do that, to have any sense of doing that, one requires a 21st century technology enabled system. If you're gonna really follow people, through early stages when they fall into a hole, get them out of a hole, engage in secondary prevention, follow people over time, promote genuine recovery, you need to be able to develop highly personalized sequences of care, combinations of care and relevant, particularly those who have comorbid substance misuse problems. So for us, we have to get serious about the care being personalized through better assessment and tracking and the tracking aspect being measurement based that that comes into real time place. This is not just a matter of keeping medical records and hoping for the best. Part of the National Mental Health Commission that I was on back in 2014 made very important recommendations. If we're ever gonna get anywhere, we have to incorporate 21st century technologies. 2014, we we're having this discussion. And there are many opportunities at the population level and at the healthcare system level where technology enabled systems for predictive modeling, for following, for optimizing interventions, for delivering at scale, for actually providing more effective high quality services would depend on the deployment 
of relevant technologies. Now, what are relevant technologies? Most of the world sees digital mental health as some sort of expanded electronic medical record. And much of the world's dominated, much clinician time is wasted still with filling in and completing very complex electronic medical data systems. In truth, these are horse and cart approaches. They're really just an improvement of the technologies that we had in the paper and pencil world. They're no more engaging of people in their care. They're no more able to deliver the measurement-based care we want. They largely exist for administrative, financial and other reasons and do not empower the kind of ongoing individualised partnership for optimal care. The truth is you really got to be looking at something really different from a technology point of view if you want to actually see a different health outcome. Health information systems are not simply apps. They're not simply self-report systems. They're not simply brief interventions. They're not standalone depression, anxiety, PTSD, eating disorder, apps for populations. They're not simple cognitive behaviour. They're not just simple one-off sets of systems. Smart systems may include a lot of those apps. They might include other technologies. They certainly will track what interventions people had over time, but they're not the same thing. The reality is, of course, most people envisage actually a horse and cart, from which they've generally had some pretty bad experiences. What we need people is to have experiences and envisage something quite different. So, Digital Mental Health 2.0 isn't a horse and cart. It's not an electronic medical record. It's not an administrative system. It's not a financial system. It's not standard clinical practice online. It's got to do with personally controlled and interactive systems, privacy protected, rapidly changing, able to deliver the types of evidence-based care at the individual level, plus also the combined data systems we need to actually track whether our services are connecting with populations in need. These things are going to happen. One of the editorials that I have in the Medical Journal Australia about the uberization of mental health, they're going to happen. The question is who's going to deliver them? They're going to happen because they're better in the end. They're the way that people will understand the world as they understand the rest of the digital world. Healthcare has been slow and mental health relatively slow to adapt. The question is, will we retool to actually influence the direction of this, or will it simply come from the private sector and elsewhere, independent and according to its own standards? I hope we're actually involved, as with those who are affected, in design and effective implementation and the equitable distribution of these services. The digital mental health argument is happening and it's overwhelming because it's good for the users and it's good for families and communities. The substance misuse area is one of the most interesting in terms of groups who are traditionally locked out, who are stigmatised or disadvantaged, being able to actually join in various ways with new services in ways that they have never been able to do in traditional clinic-based services. There are a lot of reasons why those who fund services want to actually see these systems develop in terms of their efficiency, in terms of their accountability. The real issue is for clinicians and providers. Will we take the opportunity to use personalised data, real-time data, for better care. The World Economic Forum Global Future Council I'm part of has clearly made this clear that he expects this to happen. It's the only way worldwide will ever connect with people in real need, particularly in developing countries, particularly in areas where traditional workforces and traditional clinics will never do the job. We were fortunate in Australia some time ago to have a Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, who was devoted to this. But what I want to point out to you here is a different young psychiatrist, Lara Ospina Polinos, who's actually from Colombia, is now in the business of actually taking these technologies through in South America and in developing countries. That's going to be the future, is actually clinical leadership by younger people and wanting to connect with populations in need. We were fortunate that Prime Minister Turnbull did fund a large project in Australia called Project Synergy, which looked at how we might drive mental health phenomena because we're not simply happy that mental health be uberized by the private sector. We are keen to see a serious R&D agenda develop in association and serious co-design and engagement of different populations who can use these technologies. Our aim is best care first time. Get it right, get people in, use assessment systems that people can connect with through all of the smartphones and devices and telecommunication systems they now have and get into a system and be a partner in care throughout that system as quickly as possible. That has become known through Project City now as the Inner World Platform, which is the name of the company which now actually implements that particular system and much of the data that we have has actually been generated 
the Young People in Association of Headspace Systems and others. It gives rise to platforms or results, assessment systems, lets people know about particular sets of issues, picks up key comorbidity, particularly the drug and alcohol and physical health area, and actually then starts to plan and organise in partnership with clinical services what can happen next. What he's really trying to do is sit behind all of the retail outlets. These are all the brands that we have in Australia through Headspace and Mindspot and Origin and Lifeline and Kids Helpline, many others. Bring that data together, have data travel with the person, but also combine people with a much wider world of other sets of apps. Apps for substance misuse, apps for physical health, apps for sleep wake cycles, apps for physical monitoring. One really interesting one in Australia is an organisation known as Hello Sunday Morning, which is a peer to peer system for social groups for actually control of alcohol use. Easily made available in partnership with these areas. So areas which are apps, areas which are social groups, areas which are messaging, areas which provide peer support on an ongoing basis. If you've got the right technology in the middle, you can have effective services, but also have people in those services joining the world of other accessible and hopefully high quality sets of online resources. We ourselves are involved in a continuous process of creating these sets of uh, initiatives with people in different places, in different locations, from different populations, implementing the particular uh, IT systems or health information systems, then seeking to sustain through research trials, evaluate, and a continuous process of continuous engagement and delivery. It's not a one-off. One-off clinical trials isn't the way to do this. Continuous R&D with the communities affected with the clinicians, seeing whether you're actually making a difference or not has to be the way to go. These, data, these systems then deliver back data. You can look at who is coming in, how distressed they are, what is happening in presentations over time, what is the mix of particular problems that people have, what are the patterns of comorbidity in the populations that you are looking after in real time and see whether your services are actually doing what they need to be doing. You can see what is happening in key areas like suicidality and the extent to which suicidality is detected in these areas and is actually responded to. Really challenging set of issues because in these populations, suicidality is quite high, much higher than the clinicians themselves and the clinical services often estimate. Connecting people with emergency crisis lines, connecting people with appropriate care, becoming very important. So important for us to connect with people in the community and through services early when they're at risk and before many of these problems become more enduring. Directing people away to what other care options they say they would have not otherwise received unless they come in through these sets of systems. Safety planning, the access to psychological therapies, being able to use other apps they were not aware of, actually providing those sets of information, providing quality assurance protocols around the types of apps and the types of services that we are actually recommending. So actually, rather than using search engines, trying to direct people to what we believe are the highest quality interventions available online, in person, or in services areas and service frameworks that they're actually able to access. We've been looking at what people perceive to be the barriers and facilitations to these areas, what, what we encourage people to use technologies or not. The issue of addressing service gaps is one of the biggest drivers of why people see the need in these particular sets of areas. That there is actually assisting to facilitation. It's interesting, at the health professional level, we say that we're ready for change. I'd say it's an issue about whether we are. At the actual user level, users are expecting us to change and actually use these technologies. Just like every other service industry, there's an expectation now that our services will make use of the appropriate technologies. So as we do these particular issues, it becomes clear that the big challenges are not really the technology. It's the willingness or otherwise of, in fact, the services that we have to engage with technology, with other new concepts like clinical staging, with a willingness to actually engage in partnerships of care. The technology is in truth, the relatively easy part. The hard part is actually grafting technologies onto existing services, the real challenges of responding, suddenly knowing the extent of the problem you face and what needs to be done on an ongoing basis. We've been looking at the capacity for technology to actually improve outcomes and what technology enabled care would do. So in dynamic modeling systems, we'll get sensitivities of what will happen in the future, the extent to which predicted increases in suicides, self-harm hospitalizations, et cetera, are moderated 
by technology enabled care. The coordination of care, right care first time, getting people to services, meeting their sets of needs, all significantly impact if you're using technology enabled systems. Not putting technology last, not as an add-on, not as an iPad at the end of the desk, not as a recommendation of another app, but actually as a technology informed system for the coordination of care. One of the really big problems we have at the moment, in addition to the electronic medical record concept is during COVID-19, we now have telehealth, we're now doing lots of consultations we didn't otherwise do by telehealth systems. Problem being, that's simply a substitution issue. Just adding on telehealth doesn't make an enormous big difference. It's really a substitution. It's changing the way that people actually relate, connect, follow by using technology, in addition to whatever standard clinical services may be. Really hard to do. Basically, the quicker you can do that, the quicker you can actually get services to change their model of care and then use technology effectively, the faster the impacts on these key factors like suicide, mental health presentations, comorbidity, etc. Services need to be ready to change and willing to take up the challenge. Simply introducing a new technology package to a service that's not interested in changing or is having it imposed on them, you're unlikely to see really big differences. Now that's a clinical leadership issue, there are financing issues, there are technology issues. However, the populations that we serve are in urgent need of change. So technology enabled coordinated care basically has a whole lot of characteristics and a whole lot of potential benefits. And these are the ones that have been investigated quite uh, a great deal. And they particularly are relevant to both mental health and substance misuse in the way they can actually affect. I just I draw attention to a number of factors. The extent to which information comes into a service before the person arrives and they receive the service that they need as a consequence, not the other way around. If you force people to come in, do what they ordinarily do, provide the standard service and then introduce technology, you're not gonna get very far. It needs to be upfront and part of what directs people to right care in the first time. Then whatever decisions you make, technology used is to follow the outcome. So that people deteriorate or do not improve, they actually are reviewed, they receive alternatives, they're engaged in a wide variety of other possibilities that might improve their outcome. We are very keen to be aspirational. For us, it's about actually providing the quality of services to every teenager in our country that's thinking of suicide and that they will get the kind of care and social support facilitated by technologies. Another point I'd make about technologies, they're not just clinical interventions. They provide the capacity for continual social and personal support out in the wider communities. Being smart about how we use technologies, not just in a narrow interventional sense, but in a wider community support way is a critical understanding. In Australia, we are in the process of trying to develop those partnerships. We're in the process of trying to deliver them through our primary health networks, which is our way of doing regionalization beyond that of provinces or states. You need to make some really hard decisions. What do we stop doing to in order for this to happen? And what do we prioritize? How do we shift the focus to early intervention, to multidimensional assessment, to measurement-based care, to a strong focus on social recovery, not just symptom reduction? We need to be really aware, of course, of what really works in particular areas and separate out what is being done at the community level of primary prevention in schools, in young populations, in health education, of course, in health promotion, from what is really being done for those populations at much greater risk and those who are coming into care. And there are very good examples, I'll just pick out one here from the Matilda Centre of the University of Sydney, from Professor Marie Thiessen and her colleagues of the Health for Life smartphone app, with an emphasis on those factors that may be of benefit across a whole range of outcomes. And this emphasis on school-based interventions and other widespread interventions at the universal level has potentially a particular merit. It's one level of intervention. But another level, those who are at much higher risk and those who are already in trouble require very specific interventions and tracking of their individual outcomes, not simply waiting till they deteriorate. We've got to be very clear what really works beyond the public health level, at the individual level, that those issues about early intervention personalised assessment and being recovery focused are critical. At the system level, we have systems that are actually prepared to provide multiple interventions, organise multidisciplinary care and actually track that care over time for its outcomes. 
interesting kind of set of issues about who will take real actions in this area. What is really going to happen? For us, and I suspect in Canada and elsewhere, being organised regionally really matters. And that local leadership, clinical leadership, along with partnerships with communities, incredibly model, incredibly important if this is to happen. Along with new tools like dynamic modelling of impacts in likely areas, like actually the commitment to use technology, not just for interventions, but actually to improve the quality of care. Just to make some final comments about the COVID-19 situation, which we've been modeling in Australia, this was all pretty hard pre-COVID. We all know that in the rest of the COVID world, the idea was to flatten the COVID physical health curve. We've been looking at actually try how can you flatten the mental health curve that will inevitably follow the economic and social downturns associated with the COVID pandemic. And we have made predictions about its likely impacts uh, as a consequence of the social dislocation uh, and economic and other factors, particularly for young people. And it's young people who will suffer the most in terms of COVID related factors. Really importantly, we've been looking at what is likely to work best. What's the combination of economic, education and mental health factors? And it's the mental health factors here about increasing service capacity, technology enabled care, assertive aftercare, and particularly attending to issues related to comorbidity in these areas that is likely to have the largest impact. We need to be arguing strongly right now in our respective countries that as the crisis continues and the impacts become particularly more dominant during 2021, that we take appropriate actions. Now is a time for mental health to be very active, not in the back seat just because there's a physical health crisis, particularly affecting older people. So, in the 21st century, what we really require are new models of care that are strongly focused on young people. They are developed at a regional level, so that care is available with an emphasis on access and quality and tracking in the area in which you live. That new technologies, such as the ones I've described here through the Inner World platform and others, are available. They're health information technologies. They're not standalone apps. They have to be accessible in the community, where the first point of Care is directly through the internet or through schools or through clinics. They have to engage young people. We have to say we are open for business. These are the ways in and we are prepared to provide the care that suits you, multidimensional. We are not simply a substance misuse service, a mental health service, a primary care service, a family service, a school counsellor. We will provide the range of services and coordinate those services on an ongoing basis. As I hope I've emphasised, I think the real challenge here is not the technology and the infrastructure, it's the clinical leadership. However, we do need to build the infrastructure. We need to continuously evaluate what happens at a technical level. We need the professional competency to use these technologies appropriately. We need finance systems to make sure that they're available and equitably distributed to the populations in need. Most importantly, working with young people and their families to deliver better outcomes. Thanks so much for your attention and I hope the rest of the conference proves to be extremely engaging. I'm sure through the leadership of Michael and others that that will be the case, and I hope to be back in contact with many of you personally in the very near future.